We are now in a fourth session of our study in the book of Colossians, and in this session we will be covering chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Now, before we begin, let me give a very abbreviated review. We find that Paul had learned of the situation that existed in the church in Colossae, and under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, had penned the epistle to them. And in, in essence, in the first two chapters, what he says is this. The fullness of the Godhead is in the person of Christ. Christ is in every believer. Therefore, every believer has the fullness of God. And because we have the fullness of God by having Christ, don't let anyone judge you in respect to any Judaistic feast and things which are only a shadow of that which was to come, but Christ was the body which cast that shadow, and since he has come, we have no need of those things any longer. And then he says, don't let anyone judge you to be unworthy, unworthy, unworthy of a reward in their uh, voluntary humility or delighting in their humility and the religious activity of angels because they're puffed up under their fleshly mind and not yielded to the head who is Christ. And then he says, don't allow anyone to judge you in respect to these ascetic tendencies either because these things have no value whatsoever against the desires of the flesh. But now in chapter 3 and 4, we find that He's telling us what is manifest in the life of one who is yielded to that fullness of Christ. Being yielded to the fullness of Christ does not result in some kind of an ecstatic utterance or some kind of a foolish experience that people talk about, but it is is manifest in our everyday living. Now, notice in chapter 3, verse 1, "If If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting on the right hand of God. The word if in verse 1 is a first class conditional clause, which means since. Since ye then were raised, be risen with is one word, and it's were raised with the Christ. Now, since you were raised with him in your identification with the resurrection of Christ, seek those things which are above. Now, this word seek speaks of the practical striving that we are to have. We're to have a practical striving for the things which are above. Above where? Where Christ is, sitting. The word sitteth is a present participle which renders sitting on the right hand of God. So we are to have a practical striving for the things that are heavenly, not of things upon this earth, such as uh, what we eat or drink or the feast and all of those kind of things that that are fleshly that man would do. But it's to be a spiritual pursuit for those things which are heavenly where Christ is sitting on the right hand of God. Then he goes on to say, set your affection on things above. Now notice the words, set your affection on. Uh, Here we have the uh, inward impulse and disposition of the person. Now because of the inward impulse and disposition, then we will seek after the right thing. If we have an inward impulse toward things that are above, then we're going to be practically striving after the things that are above that are heavenly rather than things upon the earth. So set your affection on things above, not on things on or literally upon the earth. Not on things that are upon the earth, but the things which are above where Christ is sitting on the right hand of the Father. Not on things upon the earth. Why? For ye are dead or literally for ye died. That is, you died with Christ when he died on our behalf and we identified with it. It was the one and the same as if we had died. And your life is hid with Christ in God. Or, better rendered, your life is hidden together with the Christ in the God. Now here we have a statement in reverse of what we've been seeing. We've been seeing the fact that the fullness of the Godhead is in Christ and Christ is in us and we have the fullness of God. Here he says, our life is hidden together with Christ in God. So, uh, we're in Christ, Christ is in us, and we are all in Christ in the person of God, in the God or the Godhead. Now, since that is true, he says, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear or shall be manifested, then shall ye also appear or be manifested with him in glory. Now, this word glory as I stated on one other session, is not a place. Glory is a state or a condition and basically means an exalted dignity, honor, and reputation. 
So when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, when he comes to take us to be himself, then we're going to be manifested along with him in an exalted dignity, honor, and reputation. He already has that, and we will be uh, exalted in that, remember? He made known the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of the exalted dignity, honor, and reputation. Now, when he comes, we know the reality of that glory, of that exalted dignity, honor, and reputation of being with him. So, therefore, since we are in Christ, and we have that promise and that expectation, here's what we should do now in this present life until that takes place. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, notice here he says to mortify these things. Uh, here, when he says to mortify, that's an old word that uh, the old folk used to use a lot, that we don't use today very much. They, we say, boy, that just kills me. The old folk would say, that mortifies me. We're saying the same thing. Now, the word to mortify uh, means to deaden, to subdue, to bring into subjection various members of our body whereby we may commit certain sins. Now, instead of mentioning the members of our bodies, he mentions the sins which may be committed by various members of our bodies. So we're to count as dead, subdue, bring into subjection the members of, of our body which are upon the earth, that whereby we may commit these particular sins. Now, what are these sins that he's talking about? First of all, he mentions fornication, or uh, fornication, which is illicit sex. Now, of course, any sex outside of marriage is illicit, whether you're married or whether you're not. It is an illicit relationship. Now, many times the word fornication is used in the scriptures pertaining to the sexual activity of a single person, whereas adultery is the sexual activity of a married person outside of the marriage. Now, fornication is many times used in reference to either, which is speaking of just an illicit sexual relationship, which is the actual physical act. And then notice these words, they build upon one another. Uncleanness. This word uncleanness speaks of an impurity. It speaks of being morally lewd. It is one, time, one thing to commit this illicit sexual activity, but it's far another to be morally lewd with it. And this uncleanness comes from a state of mind. Now, because of the state of mind, then one commits the physical act, and the physical act is committed because of the physical or the state of the mind. And then he says, inordinate affections. That is, affections are out of the ordinary. It's lustful, sensual, unrestrained affections. Lustful and sensual, unrestrained affections. Uh, affections that you don't hold back. It's a passionate drive which does not rest until it's totally satisfied. In other words, you, you're never satisfied at all. Affections that you don't hold back, you don't restrain, you feel them, you yield to them. It's what we hear so much about in our modern society today. If it feels good, do it. If a person wants it, they take it and do whatever they want to do. So inordinate affections are lustful, sensual, uh, unrestrained affections. And having a passionate drive uh, for something uh, and, and never rest, that passionate drive for it is, does never rest until it's satisfied, and then it's never satisfied because it keeps going for more. Affections that are not restrained. Now, this speaks of the emotional and psychological drive that's within one. Because of that emotional and psychological drive, the state of the mind is set, and out of the mind as a man thinks, so as he comes to the actions of life, brings forth the physical act. So the physical act is committed because of a state of mind. The state of mind is set by the emotional and psychological drive. And then he says, evil concupiscence. Evil con concupiscence. That is a longing for what is forbidden. It speaks of an evil desire. Now that evil desire is the desire of the heart and mind. The desire that one has within their heart and mind, what they daydream about, what they long for, what they think of. Now, because of the desire of the heart and mind, 
one develops an, an emotion and psychological drive which sets the state of the mind which brings back the physical act. In other words, the physical act is committed because of what one thinks in his mind and that is set by the emotion and psychological drive and that emotion and psychological drive is motivated by the desire of the heart and the mind. So these things all build upon one another. And then he says, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, notice what he talks about covetousness here. That is an insatiable selfishness or greed. It's a selfishness and a greed that can just never be satisfied. You never get enough. It's like the fellow says, I don't want to own all the land in the world. I just want to own all of that that's adjacent to mine. <laughs> uh, so you never have enough. You get this much and get more and more and more and more, whether it's money, land, property, whatever it is, our fulfillment of uh, passionate drives and desires. Now, covetousness <clears throat> speaks of one who has an avarice or a greed or a passion for riches. And that covetousness can cause one to be involved in fraudulency, which is a deliberate deception of another person in order to make gain from them for yourself. It can also lead one to extortion, uh, which is to obtain from another person by violence, threat, oppression, or abuse of authority. Now, he says covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, how is it that covetousness is, is idolatry? Simply because covetousness is a low and debasing passion like those mentioned up above. Uh, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, and evil concupiscence. Covetousness is a low and debasing a passion as those mentioned above and covetousness secures the affections which properly belong to God and is therefore idolatry. When someone has such an insatiable drive and desire and greed for something, they're just never satisfied. The insatiable, in other words, that desire is never satisfied, never have enough. We should never have that kind of a feeling and attitude toward anything except God. That we never can get enough of knowing God. As, as David was. He was a man after God's own heart. He wanted the heart of God. Now, he wasn't a perfect man by a long shot, but he desired and wanted it. And that's what we should desire after more than anything else. And when there is anything that secures that affection from us, then it is displaced God and giving that affection to that other thing that properly belongs to God, and therefore it is idolatry. Anything that displaces God in your life. Now, he goes on to say, uh, we are to mortify, count as dead, subdue these uh, portions of our body whereby we may commit these uh, various sins and covetousness, which is idolatry. Then notice he goes on to say, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. The word for is not gar, it is dia. By means of or through which things the wrath of God. The word sake is added by the translators. So he says, by means of or through which things, that is, these particular sins that have just been mentioned, the wrath of God cometh on the children or the sons of the disobedience. Now he's saying because of these kinds of sins, God's wrath comes upon the unsaved ones. In other words, he's saying these kinds of sins belong to the unsaved life and not in the life of a believer. Now, notice he did not say that these sins is what causes them to go to the wrath of the eternal judgment in hell. But he says, the wrath of God cometh upon them. There are degrees of torment in that eternal lake of fire. And the amount of wrath that God shows upon them is determined by the wickedness of the person's life and how much they're involved in these sins. In other words, he's saying these are sins that belong to an unsaved life and not to one who is a child of God in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. In the which things, the word which is a plural word, in which things, these kind of sins up here, ye, and the word ye is emphatic, it's the word to be emphasized, in which ye also walked. Now the word walked speaks of a practice or a behavior. Uh, ye walked once, sometime or literally once back in the time before your salvation, when you lived 
in them. Now the word lived speaks of a state or a condition. You lived in that state or condition, and so therefore you walked and practiced in that kind of a behavior. You did those things when you're saved. But now it is to be different, he says in verse 8. But now ye also put off all these. Now, notice the phrase, put off all these. It's an aorist middle imperative. Now, what does that mean? Aorist tense means that you are to do it at any point in time, at any point in time of your life. Middle voice means you do it in reference to yourself. It's for your own good that you're doing it. Now, imperative means that it's absolutely essential to do it if you want to be in the will of God. Now, you don't have to be in the will of God as a believer. But if you want to be, you have no choice but to do what he says here, and that is to put off all these things that he's going to mention. Now, look here. The word put off carries this meaning. It means to disrobe, to dismantle, as I would take off dirty clothing and throw it aside from me. So you dismantle and disrobe yourself of these things. Now notice it says, ye put off. It is not that you just pray and pray till you become so holy that God takes it all away from you. That is a falsely pious concept. What he says here, that you, by the very enactment of your own will, that you make the decision and you willfully do what God told you to do, that ye put off these things and it's to your benefit that you do it because if you do, you receive the blessing and the favor of God and you also have greater reward when you enter into that eternal home. Now, it's to your benefit to do it. Put off all these. What are they? Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth and lie not one to another. Now, when he says put off here, he's talking about certain behavioral patterns and characteristics we are to put out of our life. And it's our responsibility to do it, not God to take it away from us. We have the obligation by the enactment of our own will and by deliberate proper behavior to put these things out, to get rid of these behavioral patterns and things out of our life. Now, notice what these things are. Anger. Now, it's more than just getting angry and mad, as we would say. But this word is from a Greek word that carries the concept of, a, of an abiding passion for revenge. You don't just get angry and blow your stack right now. But it's a thing of an indwelling anger that you continue to carry. You have this passion and waiting within you against another person just waiting for your opportunity to get revenge. Or you may pass and repass with them and be kind and to their face and what have you. But in your mind, you're carrying this thing. You're waiting. You're just looking for that right opportunity so one day that, bam, you get them. Now, it may be physically. It may be emotionally. It may be financially. It may be in one way or the other that you try to get even and retaliate because of what this person has done or how you feel toward them. So it's carrying an abiding passion for revenge. You just want to wait your opportunity that you can do it. And then the word wrath. The word wrath is a word that carries the meaning of a sudden passion to kill. Uh, it, it's when one just blows their stack and as we say, they go hog wagon pig, pig crazy. And they say, oh, I'll kill you, I'll kill you, I'll kill you. And they do everything they could to kill another person if someone didn't grab them and hold them back. Now, it's that sudden passion to kill, that desire you get so angry that you want to kill someone. Now, when we manifest this anger or this wrath in our life, or we have it within us, it makes it obvious that we are yielded to the nature of the flesh and not to the fullness of Christ who indwells us. And then he mentions malice. That's more than just hatred. It's a, it's a word that means ill will. It means a desire to injure. It speaks of badness and trouble. It's a nature that's bent on harming others. Someone that just delights in doing these little things that harm other people. It just, get, it just tickles them all over to get to do those things. All sorts of things that we may do. Uh, a nature that's just bent on harming other people and they get delight out of it. It's just a person that we say, they're bad, they're just trouble all the time. And then there's the word blasphemy. 
The word blaspheme means to speak against or to act against. It means to speak of another person as vile or to slander that other person. And when you speak against another person with the intent that you want to cause that person to fall into disrepute in the eyes of the other, then you're blaspheming that person. Yes, you can blaspheme God, but you can blaspheme individuals as this word is used here. Uh, we often do that as the children of God. We, without thinking about it sometimes, a person will be brought up and we talk about things bad about them. And our intent is to cause the person we're speaking with to think more of us and less of them. Now he said, this is something that ought to be put out of your life. And when you do this, you are yielding to the nature and the desires of your flesh and its sinful passions rather than yielding to the nature of Christ who is within you because he would not have you to do that. That is blasphemy. And then, filthy communication out of your mouth. Well, no, we're not to tell dirty stories and jokes and things like that, but that's not what he's talking about here. The phrase filthy communication out of your mouth literally means foul-mouthed abuse. A foul-mouthed abuse. You see, it's one thing to have a foul mouth and use foul language, but it's quite another to use that foul language in order to verbally abuse another human being. That's what he is talking about. When we f use foul language and verbally abuse another person, then we are obviously yielded to the nature of the flesh and its sinful desires rather than to the fullness of Christ who is within us. So he says, these characteristics and behavioral patterns we are to put off out of our life. And then he says, lie not one to another or better rendered, stop lying to one another. <laughs> yes, even believers at times lie to one another. And I could start and give you all kinds of stories over these 50 years in the ministry in dealing with others and even with pastors, yes, pastors of good fundamental churches, Bible-believing churches, that have lied straightforward about so many things in so many ways. No need to do that. But they make up stories about things just to get out of something. He says, stop lying one to another. Why? seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man. Now, when he says having put off, uh, seeing that you have put off, that's all one word in the Greek. Having stripped off the old man. Now, again, that's not your dad. It's the old nature of sinful nature. It doesn't mean that he's eradicated and done away with and not there anymore. But you have put aside these things. Now, notice up above, we have the admonition as believers to put off these sinful behaviors. So the fact that we're admonished to put them away out of our life makes it obvious that many believers can have those things in their life, which is also makes it obvious that the old nature is not done away with, it's still there. So what he's saying here is, seeing that you have put off this nature, it, it has died with Christ in position, but not in reality, and having put on the new man. That is the new man. And what is this new man? It's that new nature of Christ that has come into us, which is renewed or which is being renewed uh, in or unto a full knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now this word image is the word icona, a form of the word icon, which we saw earlier in chapter 1 which means the visible manifestation and representation of him that created him. Now, we have a renewing of the full knowledge of the one that created us. Now, Christ is fully God. He is the one who created all things. We saw that clearly in chapter 1. Now, when Christ comes into us as the fullness of God, there is the re-establishing within us the fullness of that wisdom and knowledge of God. And when he says that we were created in the image of God, it is not physical image and likeness, it is rational and moral image and likeness, which is established in many cases the Word of God that we don't have time to go through and analyze. But it is a rational and moral. Now, 
When Christ came in, we have the fullness of God, and we have, if we would yield to him, that rational and moral nature of God that we are to yield up to. So we're to put off this old nature, and we're to put on the new, because we have the responsibility of putting off these behavioral patterns that would manifest the old nature, and put on the proper characteristics and behavior patterns that would manifest the new nature of Christ. Now, the, it is renewed in the full knowledge after the visible manifestation representation of him having created him. Where or wherein, that is, in that new nature in Christ who is within us, there is neither, there is not Greek and Jew. There's not a distinction between the high culture of the Greeks and the lower culture of the Jews. That distinction is not there. Once you're in Christ, we're on even grounds. Now, he says there's not that distinction between the cultures. And there's not that dis distinction between circumcision and, the word nar is literally and, uncircumcision. In other words, there's not the religious distinction but between the highly religious Jew who was circumcised and the Gentile world that was not circumcised. That distinction is not there once you're in Christ. And there's not the distinction between barbarian and Scythian. Now, a barbarian doesn't mean what we ordinarily think of as a barbarian today, but the Greek word meant a non-speaker. In other words, someone that did not speak your language was a barbarian. So someone that didn't speak the same language you do is barbaric. And we seem to think that way today sometimes. If we hear other people speaking in another language, we wonder if they're think thinking about us and we're fearful and afraid they might attack us or something. And said, so that, that's not a distinction between people that speak different languages, nor Scythian. Now, what is a Scythian? Well, a Scythian would be what we ordinarily think of as a barbarian, but he would be a barbarian to a barbarian. Now, that's rather barbaric. A Scythian was a very cruel tribes of people, sort of like roving bands of gypsies, and they were extremely cruel in their activities, and in, especially in their military activities. They were not satisfied to kill the enemy. They would cut off their head, drink their blood, and make a drinking cup out of their skull. When their leader would die, they would bury him, and they would kill several of his attendants and bury with him. And on the anniversary of his death, they'd return to the grave site and kill and disembowel several people and mount them on dead horses about the tomb. That is very barbaric. But in Christ, once one of those people becomes saved, they are all the same. There is no distinction of such things in Christ. And then he says, bond nor free. Whether you're a slave or a free man, it doesn't matter. And in the day that these epistles were written and in the days of Christ, we are told by historians that there were more slaves than there were free people. So he says there's not that distinction between the bond and the free. But Christ is all and in all. Both of those words all are plural words. Christ is everything and he's in everyone. Everyone that is a believer, he's in them, and it doesn't make any difference what your cultural background is, what your educational background is, anything about you, nor what nationality you are, whether you're bond or free, Christ is in that person. Now, so he says, put off all of these negative characteristics. Now look at verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another if, you have, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, also do ye. Now, notice the word put on. That is also an Arius middle imperative. Remember the word put off meant to disrobe, dismantle, as you would take off dirty clothing and lay it aside? The word put on means to enrobe, to envelop yourself in. Now I put on the clean clothing once I've taken off the dirty. And its middle voice says it's to our benefit that we do because if we do, we will have the blessing and the favor of God plus greater reward in eternity. Put on therefore as the elect of God. Now the word elect is a plural word, elect ones, and the word elect is somewhat synonymous to the word saint, to the saved ones of God. Holy and beloved, highly valued ones. Uh, the word beloved is a perfect passive participle. 
having been and being highly valued. The word beloved is a form of that word agape. Now, we say, well, phileo and agape, that's two different Greek words for love. Phileo is brotherly love, agape is godly love, but that's not really true. It's far more than that. We find that both of those words are used of God, they are both used of man, they're both used of good, and they're both used of evil. Analyze it through the New Testament, you'll find that to be true. Now, that means that it's not just phileo, a brotherly love, and agape, a godly love. Phileo is a love which is stimulated in me by you from the outside. It's stimulated from the outside by God or a person or something, whether the thing is good or bad. And by the amount of delight and pleasure that I derive from that other person or thing, I respond in direct ratio to that. So phileo is a responsive type love, referring to the amount of delight and pleasure that I derive from a person or a thing. Now agape, on the other hand, is not stimulated from the outside. Agape is a love which arises within me because of the value which I place upon God or a person or anything, whether the thing is good or bad. Now, how much value I place upon God or anyone or anything is measured how? It's measured by how much I'm willing to give, to give up, go out of my way, expend myself, or put myself out for God, another person, or anything. It is the word we find in John 3.16, God so loved or highly valued the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Now, how highly do we value the world? How much are we willing to give for the salvation of others? But it's also the word in John 3, 19, that men loved or highly valued darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. It's also the word that Paul used when he said, Demas has forsaken me having loved or having highly valued this present world. Demas, a saved man, a preacher, yeah. But he put a higher value upon the things of the world than he did upon the things of God, and so he forsook the ministry and went to the ways of the world. So the word is used of good and of bad of man and of God. And so here he says, as saved ones therefore, you are to put on you holy and beloved ones, the ones having been and continuing to be highly valued. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and highly valued, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, and so forth. Now what are these characteristics and behavioral patterns that we are to put on? Notice, first of all, he says we are to put on bowels of mercies. That phrase literally would be better rendered tender-hearted pity. We ought to pity a lot of people rather than becoming angered and hurt with them. Now, when people say things adverse to me or about me, or they do things adverse to me, now, if I become hurt, what does that say about me? That says I am selfish and self-minded. What my proper attitude ought to be is this. Rather than being hurt and feeling hurt, I should feel a pity toward them. I should have a tender-hearted pity toward them. Why? Because I know that they're going to have to give answer to God for what they're doing. Now, I should pity them and feel for them rather than myself. When I get hurt, it is evidence that I am concerned about myself rather than the other person. So he said, put on bowels of mercies. And if we do that, it's because we're yielding to the fullness of Christ who is within us. If we don't do it and we become hurt, then we're yielded to the nature of self rather than to the fullness of Christ. And then he says, kindness, put on kindness. This word carries the meaning of usefulness. It speaks of a moral excellence And if you have that moral excellence of character, then it will come out in your behavior. So there's to be a moral excellence in one's character. And then he says, humbleness of mind, or a humiliation or a modesty of mind. It's having a sense of one's littleness, not a feeling of how great you are and how important you are. Some people feel that they're so great because they have money or because they have a lot of possessions or because they have a lot of education or whatever. They feel like that they are the it. Now he says the thing that you should see is that you're nothing. We're to have a sense of our littleness and nothingness before God and fully subjected to him meekly rather than feeling how great we are. I wish 
many people understood this statement that is in Scripture. And then he says not only a humiliation or a modesty of mind, but he says meekness. Have a meekness. Now, meekness is not weakness. It is not cowardice. It is not that attitude that bows back, well, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know. No, that's being cowardly. That's not what meekness is. The word meekness speaks of a gentleness. It's a submissiveness. You have a gentle, submissive nature before God. Remember that the Word of God defines Moses as being the most meek man ever to live on the face of the earth. Now, Moses was the great, bold leader of Israel. But he did not do anything until, first of all, he got his instructions from God. He meekly was submissive to God. It was a power under control. Meekness is a submission before God, which is expressed in attitude and kind acts toward others. It's the opposite of an arrogant self-assertiveness. Power under control, the opposite of an arrogant self-assertiveness. So he says, put on this meekness. And if we put on these characteristics of tender-hearted pity and kindness and humiliation and modesty of mind and a meek, gentle attitude, it is because we are subjected to the fullness of Christ who is within us. If we don't, it's because we're yielded to the desires of the sinful nature of our flesh. And then he says, put on long-suffering. We must put this on. This is a characteristic and behavior pattern we're to have. What is long-suffering? It means longanimity, uh, which is the, the ability to endure a long time under offenses and enduring under those offenses from others without revenge or retaliation. You don't try to get revenge and you do not want to retaliate. And then he says, put on forbearance. Forbearance simply means to put up with. It means to endure. It means to endure our own labors, whatever they might be. Or to endure the insults, the injuries, the faults and the thoughtlessnesses on the parts of others. Just keep on enduring and putting up with it. To forbear. Now, if we yield and subject to the Spirit of Christ who is within us, then we will put up with these things and we'll never desire to get even with them or to retaliate and get any revenge in any way. And then he says, forgiveness. Forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel or a a complaint or a cause of blame against any, Even if the other person is wrong and you have justifiable reason to have blame against them, he says, just forgive them. How? Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Now, when he says to forgive, he did not say to forgive them if they come and ask you to forgive. He just says, if you have reason to blame them, forgive them. He didn't say to forgive them if they come and confess their fault. No, he just said, forgive them whether they ever admitted or not, whether they ever recognized or not that they've done anything against you. Just forgive. What does forgive mean? Well, I often hear people say, well, you've got to forgive and forget. If you don't forget, you haven't forgiven. That's not true. You may remember the rest of your life what that person did, but to forgive means you don't hold it against them. You don't hold it against them. Now, to forgive is to grant that person a pardon. You don't hold him against, hold it against them anymore. It's to pardon. You don't hold it. Now let's suppose that someone commits a crime against our state. And, and they commit that crime against the state. Then they are convicted and put in prison. But the governor grants them a full pardon. Now what does that mean? That means that the society of your state doesn't hold it against that person any longer. They're put free. Now, the governor and everyone in the state may always remember what that person did, but it's not held against them anymore so far as the society of the state is concerned. That is forgiveness. He says here, if they've done it, just forgive them. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Now, to forgive means that we harbor no malice against that person. 
it means that we treat that person as if they had never given us a, a cause of complaint against them whatsoever. It means that we declare that person forgiven if they ever come and ask us to do so or admit their fault against us. But when you do, you don't make a big story. Brother, sister, you've been forgiven all along and let it go at that and don't try to make a big issue and make yourself feel piously over them and try to make them feel small about it. That would be sin in itself. It means that we will always treat that person as kindly as if he'd never injured us at all, just as God treats us when he forgives us. Now, when God forgives us, would you like to have God hold against you all of the things you've done contrary to him in your life? Aren't you glad that he doesn't? When he forgives, he doesn't hold it against us anymore. That's the way we are to treat a brother and sister in Christ <clears throat> or any fellow human being. Now, to forgive means that we forgive how? As Christ forgave us. Well, how did Christ forgive? He did it very freely. He didn't hesitate at all. He did it entirely. He pardoned all of our offenses. He did it forever. He did it so as to remember our sins against us no more and to treat us ever onward as if we had not sinned at all so we should forgive an offending brother. Now, God, being God, cannot forget anything. If he did, he wouldn't be God. It doesn't say that he never remembers our sins anymore. The scripture says he doesn't remember them against us anymore. God will always know, but he doesn't hold it against us. Now, I want you to note something. Solomon said in Proverbs 13.10, Only by pride cometh contention. Now, when one or two persons or two societies, as the case may be, are filled with pride, they're going to have contention with one another. And only in pride do we fail to forgive. Christ said in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, that we should forgive in order to be forgiven. If we're not willing to forgive others, then he says, the Lord will not forgive us our trespasses against him. So we have an obligation again. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 7, and 8 that we should be willing to be defrauded and deprived of what is ours for the good of the cause of Christ. How much concern do you have for the cause of Christ above self? Paul also said in 1 Corinthians 10, 31 and 11, 1 that we should do all things with a view to the salvation of others, being concerned for others more than selfishness concern for ourselves. Now, notice he says we are to put on these various characteristics and behavioral patterns and if we do it's because we're subjected to the fullness of Christ who is within us and if we do not it's because we are yielded to the nature of the flesh. Now, notice he goes on to say in verse 14 and above all things put on charity which is the bond of perfectness. And is dead, but above is epi, which means upon. But upon all these, all of these positive characteristics that you put on now as clean clothing, you put on something else. And he says, upon all of these. Now, as I have put on all of this clean clothing, now as a top coat, I put upon, as you would a top coat, over all of these things. And what is it? charity or agape, a high value on God and fellow man. Now, we are to bind all of these things together and penetrate them all with a high value on God and fellow man, which is the bond, literally, which is the uniting bond of perfectness or completeness. The uniting bond of completeness. Now, the best bonding agent is that which penetrates the two objects and makes them as one. In other words, I put something on this material and on this and stick them together. That's not the best bonding agent. The best bonding agent is something like an electric well which penetrates the two and makes them melt together as one. Now he says, love is the uniting bond of completeness. And this love is to penetrate all of these characteristics and therefore, we have a uniting bond of completeness in Christ. 
And once we have these characteristics because we are willfully subjected to the Spirit of Christ in His fullness who is within us, then he says, let the peace of God rule, preside, umpire, or arbitrate in your heart. Let that peace of God, that binding together of God, that binding together, you have the word peace, remember, means a binding together, that binding together of the Godhead with you, because the fullness of the Godhead is in Christ, Christ is in you, and now that binding together of you and He being one, let that ruler, presider, umpire in your heart. Don't be allowing the nature of the flesh and its sinful desires to be the rule and the guiding principle and to umpire and and arbitrate in your heart. But let it be that binding together with God to the which also ye are called or ye were called or saved in one body and be ye thankful. You were saved to that end that he might live out through your life not you having the nature of the flesh being manifest and be thankful unto God for it. And then he goes on with the admonition in verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly or abundantly or extravagantly. The two words let dwell is just one word in the Greek. They're separated here. He says, the word of Christ let dwell in you. Now let dwell is a present active imperative. Present tense is something you're to do and constantly do. Uh, Active is something it's your responsibility to do. And imperative says that it's imperative imperative, essential that you do it if you want to be in the will of God. So he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, abundantly, or extravagantly. How is the word of Christ going to come to abide and dwell and live in us in an abundant, extravagant way? Only when we are willing to subject ourselves to the Spirit of God, to the Christ who indwells us, in whom are hidden all of the treasures of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. The one we have received that we might know and understand the things that are given to us of God in the Word of God. The only way is to subject and put much time in reading and studying and analyzing the Word of God, taking it in that it might take up dwelling in you. Let Him dwell in you richly, comma, in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another. Now notice in your English Bible you have a comma after the word wisdom. And I would remind you that there is no punctuation in the Greek text. That's all added by man. It's an interpretive thing. I would place the comma after the word richly and remove the one after the word wisdom. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly or abundantly. And then with that word of Christ being abundant in you, in all wisdom teach and admonish one another. Now if we have the wisdom of Christ because we have had the Word of God to abundantly dwell in us, then in that wisdom we can teach one another and we can encourage one another, admonish or encourage one another. And then as a believer, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing in or with grace in your heart to the Lord. The word heart is a singular word. In your heart to the Lord. Now, in Psalms, he's speaking of a, a song that's accompanied by stringed instruments, such as the Old Testament Psalms. Hymns is a song of praise, and spiritual songs is songs where they're without accompaniment. So he says, as the believer, have this music and song in your heart, and let it be to the Lord. And verse 17, whatsoever you do, or literally whatsoever you may do, Whatever it is you may do in word or in work. The word deed is just an old English word for work. Whatever you may do in word or in work. Do all things. This word all is a plural word. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Everything you do, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Therefore, if you are wanting to do something that you cannot do in the name of Christ, then you should not do it. Can you dig a ditch in the name of the Lord? Oh yes, that's honest work. Can you build a house? Can you be an electrician? Drive a truck? Oh yes. Can you, can you work in the liquor industry? Drive the beer truck and distribute it? No, you can't do that in the name of the Lord. That's contrary to the things of God. There's anything that you cannot do in the name of the Lord, we should not be doing it as a child of God. Whatsoever you may do in word 
or whatsoever you may do in work, do all of those things in the name of the Lord Jesus, and be giving thanks to the God, that is to the Godhead and the Father, by means of or through him. The word by is dia, by means of or through him. So be giving thanksgiving to the Godhead and the Father by means of or through Christ, because you're doing all things in his name. Now notice, since the fullness of the Godhead is in Christ, and Christ is in every believer, every believer has the fullness of God indwelling him. And the outward manifestation of whether or not we yielded to that fullness is determined by whether or not we put off certain characteristics and behavioral patterns, whether or not we put on certain characteristics and behavioral patterns. If we do as God has told us to do, then it is because we are yielded to that fullness. But if we have those negative characteristics and behavioral patterns, it's because we're yielded to the nature of the flesh.